Welcome to Saz Talks Money on Valuetainment. I have a very special guest today, uh, the one and only Danielle DiMartino Booth. Wait till you hear this bio. Danielle is the CEO and Chief Strategist at Quill Intelligence. Remember that name, Quill, because we're going to come back to that. She is an economist, a monetary thought leader. She worked on Wall Street for uh, many years. She then worked at the Dallas Federal Reserve. She's the author of the book, Fed Up. Uh, play on words with the Fed. She's a business speaker. She's a commentator. She's featured on all the major uh, media outlets, to name a few, CNBC, Bloomberg, Fox Business, Wall Street Journal, uh, Yahoo Finance. Oh, and you also may recognize her from her segment here on Valuetainment, Down the Middle with Danielle DiMartino Booth. And um, Danielle, welcome to the show. Let's talk money. All we talk is 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 money. Let's talk money. It's great to be here. I love the new digs. Well, thank you. Um, Boca this time of year is a little bit better it's, than Dallas this time My of year. gosh, yes. Okay. Um, it's Friday. It is Friday. It's so Friday. It's so Friday. We're in a Friday kind of mood. It's a non-farm payroll we, Friday, so there's lots to talk about. Lots to talk about. What I think we should do, because we've done business all week. We have. We, 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 we've worked so hard. The drudgery. It's so tough out there. <laughs> And now it's Friday, and I think we should start happy hour a little <laughs> bit early. I think we should have a fun segment here. We're going to talk money. We've got a lot of stuff to cover. But I think before we do, we should have maybe one glass of wine. Well, that'll ease up the conversation. I think so, too. Now, I hear that you're a Chardonnay kind of gal. I am. It's so stereotypical, but it is what it is. You're a classy lady, and classy ladies drink Chardonnay, especially on Fridays. True. Now, I asked people to keep in mind that your company that you founded, that you run, your CEO, is called Quill Intelligence. So uh-huh. when I went looking for a glass, a bottle <laughs> of wine, uh-huh. uh, I heard that you had a favorite. They did not have that. I said, let me pick what I think you would pick as your second favorite bottle of wine, and here's what I selected. I went with... Can we get a drum roll? Drum roll. I went with Quilt Chardonnay in honor of Quill Intelligence. <laughs> this is where I came up with that. I've never Have heard ever of seen that. This? No, that's fantastic. So, it's from Napa, it's a Chardonnay, and I think we should have a glass of wine in honor of Quill Intelligence. We'll this use some just, of our intelligence this today. This is brilliant. And now you have a, like, sort of a, this is, could be a plug for you. Um, to have some. So should we have one? Glass you know, of it's wine? past time for me to get out to Napa. If it they would, if they would open, somewhere. if they would open the state up, I'd go. Sam, we're gonna need a. Nope, we don't need a bottle opener because it, it's a twist off. Ladies first, may may I pour Please. you? Please. Okay. Tell me when. <laughs> that looks pretty good. All right, Danielle DiMartino Booth and Adam Sosnick are drinking on a Friday. Sam's here. Sam, do you have a glass? Well, you're invited, Sam. Tell myself when and when. Okay. We will put that down. And if the interview goes exceptionally well, we might have another glass of wine. You never know. Okay. So this will go here. And it's Friday. Danielle, it is a pleasure to be sitting with you. Cheers. Cheers. L'chaim. Salud. All the Salud. above. Salud. And cheers to all our friends out there on Valuetainment and Valuetainment Economics uh, watching this interview. Speaking of interview... I think it's time to start the interview. Let's let's do some interviewing. Okay. So um, what I have here is something that I think is a little exciting. I think it's a little exciting. It's rather than your typical interview where I kind of just, you know, I, I have cards here. Homework, cards is, here. homework is key. I did some homework in honor of you. I actually, you know, the dog did not eat my homework. I actually did my homework last <laughs> night. I came in prepared. I got the bottle of wine. I got my cards. And here's what I have. You don't hear that every day, by the way. I did yeah. my homework and I got the bottle of wine. It's just, it, anyway. So. <laughs> That's actually very rare. <laughs> so what we had, so when I asked you yesterday about this interview, mm-hmm. uh, I said, uh, I'm thinking a little bit more personal finance driven. And you said, well, cool, but I'm more macroeconomics, right? Yep. So what I have here, and then I'm going to turn this but over to you. But that drives my investing philosophy. So it's all interconnected. Okay. So what we have here are three sets of cards. We have macro, macroeconomics, uh, microeconomics, which is a little bit more my wheelhouse, personal finance. I love that kind of stuff. And then in honor of your segment, down the middle, we have the down the middle card, which isn't necessarily macro or micro. 
uh, it's sort of down the middle. So before we get started, do you want to give any sort of intro to this, you know, interview, anything that's on your mind, top of mind before I got to well, I mean, again, it's non-farm payroll Friday, so I have all kinds of numbers running through my mind uh, because it's it's Jobs Friday. So, uh, I mean, you, you've got perfect timing, so we can jump right on into macro. Jobs Friday. And it's I saw Friday. something uh, just popped up right before we started. Yeah, I mean, my, my family, going. my house, everything comes to a to a screeching halt at 8.30 in the morning, Eastern Standard Time, when the when the jobs data get released. Everybody knows to be really quiet. Now, when is the jobs report released? It's typically your first Friday of the month. Okay. Unless the first Friday of the month is like the first. Gotcha. But it's typically the first Friday of every month. And it is by and far the biggest market moving data point that exists on planet Earth, by the way. Okay. In the entire world. It's the biggest data point. The, the jobs. The jobs number. Yeah. Wow. That's that big. Okay. Well, U.S. consumption is... 17% of global GDP. So if you're not working, you're not making money. So that's why it's it's the biggest market. Mover. Okay, so before we even get into macro, let's just address this. Why is it so important that every month this jobs report comes out? Obviously, there's 10 million people unemployed. And there's still 10 million people unemployed. Okay. But, uh, you know, prior to COVID, you know, we, we had the lowest unemployment rate, three and a half percent since 1969. I mean, it was just, we, we were living in an incredible era in terms of the percentage of U.S. workers who were in the workforce. And then came the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And now we're trying to sort out when we're going to get onto the other side of this finally. So we're at, I think, 6.2% to be exact. 6.2%. 10 million million people still out of work. Mm -hmm. You mentioned getting to the other side of this. Yep. When do you see the other side of this actually happening? A year, two years, longer? At the current rate that jobs are being created, it's still going to be about two and a half years. Hmm. The problem that we're starting to see is permanent joblessness. We call it economic scarring. And when people have been out of the workforce for a long time, their skills atrophy. It's like if you don't exercise for a long time, your muscles atrophy. You get sloppy. You get sloppy. And employers look at people who have been out of the workforce for a long time, and they're like, ah, no. It's a stigma, if you Hmm. will. And that's becoming problematic because even though we've had tremendous amounts of job creation, we're pulling in all kinds of leisure and hospitality workers back off the sidelines, uh, face-to-face service type of jobs that that couldn't be done until really we, we got further into the vaccination process, which we are, and it is proceeding splendidly nationwide. So we're pulling all these people who were sidelined back into the workforce, but yet... 41.5%, that's a record high post-COVID, 41.5% of those who are unemployed have been unemployed for 27 weeks or more. That's going to become problematic to get them Say back. Say those numbers slowly. So I 41.5%. Okay, so a little less than half of the people, 41%. Who are for, unemployed okay. have been unemployed for 27 weeks or more. Wow. And that so tends, it's a half a year. It's a half a year. Wow. And that tends to be where employers start to view the resume a little bit differently. Ooh. Why has this person been out of work for so long? So they might look to a new job entrant or somebody who's switching jobs before they look to somebody who's been out of the workforce, right or wrong. Well, but if again, you're going to have a resume and have a blank right. for six months, right? this is talking to our friends out yeah. there, write something. I mean, there, there is a, Put something in there. there. Is I was a, uh, uh, reading yeah. a lot. I, I, don't I mean, just, yeah, it was a six month gap. My LinkedIn feed. I've got more than 250,000 followers on LinkedIn. Wow. I get bombarded uh, all the time with, I can do this work. I can do th-. A lot of people have just hung out their own shingle in a post-COVID world and called themselves a consultant. So it's, you know, DDB incorporated. And you see this a lot, but mm. you also, by the same token, know that they're not pulling in the money that they once were. Mm. So you don't want to get into a situation where the federal government has to step in and effectively subsidize incomes indefinitely. That's called socialism. And we don't want to go there. We definitely do not. Well, where we do want to go is to our first question. Okay. This is the first macro question. And here we go. Um, The the topic is threats. Uh, In your opinion, what is the biggest internal economic threat in America? And what is the biggest external economic threat to America? So these are pretty easy. Uh, Income inequality, I think, is the biggest risk to the U.S. economy. It's a lot of uh, the driver behind 
all of the divisiveness that we've seen, the protests, um, the fires in the streets, the, 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 the political rancor, the rhetoric being as, as hateful as it is, this, a lot of it comes down to the fact that the haves have more than they ever have mm -hmm. and the have nots have less than they ever had. So this massive divide is very bad for the U.S. economy. Is this what we always hear about the K-shaped economy? The K-shaped economy, okay. exactly, exactly. And that's how it's been. Mm. Uh, and it's still going in that direction. The and it, did, that, did that start, when did that really start? Because that, in well, 2008, it, it, during the recession, you had the- Well, but you had, you know, you had the Fed come Street. out and start printing money. I mean, it mm -hmm. really got going after 2008 because the Fed's quantitative easing policies, the printing of the money, if you will, mm -hmm. that tends to flow into people in, in, into portfolios, investment portfolios. It helps out people who have stock holdings, which is 55% of Americans. Right. So the other 45% are the have-nots, if you will, because the Fed's policies don't reach them. Hmm. And that's why you see discussions about Janet Yellen and how she might get money directly to the people. But again, it's a slippery slope. It's, you know, it's... It's socialism and drag. And how, so how do we solve this income? Oh, if gosh. that's the biggest yeah. internal threat in America, how do we solve? I know this is a loaded question. Yeah. How do you solve income inequality? You, you invest in productivity. You, uh, you do massive infrastructure spending that creates mm. jobs. You do what Germany does. You have jobs reskilling. I mean, if, if, if we're going to spend taxpayers' money, why don't we give the people who've been out of work or whose industries have become... You know, permanently redundant, like bricks and mortar retailers. I mean, you, you've got Disney here in Florida that's doing an amazing business in their theme parks. At the same time, they're closing 60 of their, re of, of their retail stores throughout mm. North America. That's 60 people whose jobs, whose job skills aren't going to be transferable because we're not, we're not turning back online shopping. We're going to continue to shop online. So, but take that worker who's been displaced and give them a new skill set. Invest in productivity. Invest in productivity. Invest it. in jobs reskilling. Invest in, in, in programs that create jobs, and you will naturally grow the economy. Great response. Now, what do you think is the biggest external economic China. threat? China. One word answer. China. Now, just elaborate on that, because you know we talked about this earlier on the podcast. We've been talking about China and uh, all the wrongdoings that they're doing and, uh, and all their agenda made in you know, 2025. You know, What's the deal with China? It's bigger than that. You know, Huawei has a third of the world's telecommunications equipment. A third. Wow. Once that number gets to 50%, the United States has basically lost the war. Not the battle, but the war. And where's the United States in that number? If they have a third, what a fraction? I mean, we've, Less than 10%? Oh my gosh, yes. Wow. And that's, that's the issue, is that we've stopped producing in America what's going to carry the world into the next generation, whether it's artificial intelligence, quantum computing, telecommunications equipment, semiconductor manufacturing, this is all next gen. Hmm. I mean, your car, your average car, I think it takes 200 semiconductors to build your average car. And we don't produce semiconductors, enough of them here in the United States. And so once China wins this technological race, pre-COVID, the estimates were that China would overtake the U.S. economy in 2030, pre-COVID. Pre-COVID. Post-COVID, because they obviously were able to force the, their will upon the people to not move, mm -hmm. to shut down. So they were much more rigorous because it's a communist nation. They can be controlling of their people. But China was able to reopen more quickly than a lot of places in the rest of the world that kind of had in the middle type of covid policies. Is the China thing taking over the number one spot in the economy? Is it inevitable or is there a way it's not just inevitable? It is it is happening. So pre COVID 2030 was when China was going to become the largest. Right now, the estimates are now for 2028. If China's currency continues to appreciate in value versus the dollar, mm -hmm. it could be as soon as 2026, five years. For some reason, have you ever seen the movie uh, Ricky Bobby? Oh, yeah. Okay, great movie. Talladega Nights. Ricky Talladega Bobby. Nights. And like the most famous line in that movie was he says, if you ain't first, you're last. True. Right? So America's been first for 70 Look, plus years. British pound sterling started to decline in 1921. It was shortly after after World War World I. War I yeah. And that is when the dollar began its century-long rise. So 
These things do go in long cycles, mm -hmm. but we have to understand that there are more than economic implications to losing the superpower status. There are, there are other geopolitical factors that we have to take into account if China becomes the largest economy. And it appears to be inevitable because again, look at, look at post COVID. More than $5 trillion, once we get this next $1.9 $1 trillion, more than $5 trillion, not a penny of it put into productive means by our government. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, China's got 30 airports that are under construction. And they've they're got high-speed railways and our, our infrastructure is falling apart and they're building out the next gen. So we just, we've, we've unfortunately, President Trump's trade policies put the focus on soybeans, mm -hmm. which, I mean, China needs to import food. It's important, but their focus has been on semiconductors. So we- Soybeans, semiconductors. That's sort of the, the battle that- Today, tomorrow. Wow, wow. So well, I'm going to have a drink to that response. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> That's, that was rough. I'm not going to have a drink to that response because I hope that, I hope there's a third party initiative. I hope there's some kind of movement I, I'm, I'll, I'll totally get behind to make government work again. Because we're a big country. We're a great country. We're innovative people. And we need to figure out how to make government work for everybody again. So well, I'll drink to that too, because that's, that we can drink to. That Great we can drink response. to. America first. America first. Okay. Now would be uh, time for our first Let's micro go there. question. Okay. Micro question. Now, obviously, if you're not familiar with microeconomics, it's real, more personal finance driven, sure. you know, whereas macro, we're talking global. Bigger picture. Bigger picture. Okay. So, um, I broke, the, you know, they say everything in threes. So mm -hmm. I, I broke this down into three different types of people. What would your general financial advice be for these three different types of people? Person A making 30,000 a year, person B making 100,000 a year, and person C making a half a million dollars a year. Different tax brackets, different mm -hmm. income. I'm not, I'm not, you know, we can, you know, they're married, they're not married, it doesn't really matter about that, but it's um, just general advice to, to making that kind of money and where they should go with that. Well, so it's, um, it's easy enough for me to be cliche and say everybody needs to save 10% of what they make. Mm -hmm. That's not very easy to do when you make $30,000. It's probably not even feasible if you're making $100,000. Um, if you are making $100,000, you better be saving 10% of your income. Mm -hmm. If you're making a half a million dollars, you better be saving more. Because the lifestyle to which you are becoming accustomed based on your income is going to ha you're going to have to save more in order to retain that lifestyle when you retire, if you ever retire. I don't think I'll ever retire. Too hyper. But, but for the $30,000 person, you know, it's, it's, it's exceedingly difficult. Uh, you need to think bigger. COVID has done something kind of extraordinary. We've, we've kind of Italianized the economy in a way because you have multiple generations living underneath one roof, which is very Latin, very Italian. Mm -hmm. um, that's not such a bad idea. If housing is a third of your typical household's expense and you can figure out a way to mitigate housing expenses, double up a few generations, have your grandmother in the house so that you can be a millennial who has kids but isn't overwhelmed with childcare expenses, such that you're always borrowing and, and falling behind that bottom of the K. So think about shacking up and thereby mitigating your expenses so you can start to save more. So you can start to move your way towards financial independence. Look holistically at your budget and try and come up with solutions that where you're not just saying, God, the rents in this area they start at 2000 a month. My gosh. Think about living with your parents. At least for a short period of time while you can save up to... Sure. So and it's, it, it can yeah. be a stage of your life. Of course. Um, the days it, of like, I'm 18, I'm out, don't necessarily have to be the, the norm these days. No. You could live there for a handful of I years mean, I, or grandma I, moves in, whatever. Yeah, I started off at community college and I didn't leave home until I got my undergraduate degree. And that mm -hmm. boded well for me. I didn't have a penny of student debt after my undergraduate degree. Gotcha. So, so um, the big earners out there, they're making, you know, because the good times don't last forever. There's been years where I've made yeah. an amazing amount. There's been years where, you know, like you said, a budget, uh, someone who's killing it out there and they think, yeah, I'm going to make a quarter million, a half a million, the rest of my life, everything's going to be great. 
Is that always true? What's your advice for the big earners well, out there? Well, I mean, right now, with valuations where they are in the stock market, with the SPACs, with the Bitcoin, with the speculation, with everybody losing their minds on Reddit and Robinhood, uh, you know, when you see this kind of in-your-face level of speculation, mm-hmm. it always takes me back to my days on Wall Street during the dot-com boom. And I had several colleagues who were in investment banking who were just killing it because every dot-com company was going public and they were making money based on the the volume of IPOs, sounds familiar today. They would sell the crap out the front door. They would take their own earnings and put it into Berkshire Hathaway stock and triple tax exempt munis. So I always was intrigued by do as they do, not as they say. Oh, yeah. When it comes to building your wealth, you have to make sure that you're not all in speculative because you can wake up one day and be like, oh, God, I've got to work for another 10 years. I just mm-hmm. lost it all. So if you if you make a lot of money, you have the latitude to be a little bit more prudent in your investment allocations. And if you make a lot of money, you're typically a little bit further along in your career where you do need to start being prudent in your selections. Respect. Down the middle. Down the middle. Let's go down the middle. Okay. What's the best financial advice you've ever received? Uh, don't, don't get in debt. That's simple. Mm-hmm. You're not a fan of debt. I don't have a penny of it. Did you ever have debt? I had student loans um, when I was interviewing on Wall Street and I was in business school in Austin. I had to pay for myself to go back and forth for these interviews. Mm-hmm. So that's the only time I've had credit card debt mm-hmm. was when I was financing those trips. And the minute I could pay off my student loans when I was on Wall Street, I paid them off. So I had a mortgage for a few years, Mm -hmm. but I mean, I basically couldn't sleep at night. Now, a lot of people, this is not an option, but for me, it's been able to give me security and freedom Hmm. to not have to worry about paying that bill. Peace of mind. Peace of mind. So I interviewed Robert Kiyosaki, you know, rich dad, poor dad. A lot of people know him. And... (laughs) He has a, probably the exact uh, re- different relationship, exact opposite relationship yep. when it comes to debt. So why is he wrong and why are you right? Or why, well, you know, how okay, would you so interpret I, that? I, I will say this. Um, this is the first time when mortgage, when the 30 year fixed mortgage rate cracked 3% and it was like two, two and change. Mm-hmm. That was one of the first times I ever said, you know, it wouldn't be bad in this environment to have a mortgage because servicing the debt is basically free. So I see that, but you should never have more debt than what you can pay off with with liquidity that exists. So if you wanna have the debt, that's fine, but you have to have the capacity to pay it off. What do you mean by that with the liquidity that exists? So if you buy one and buy a million dollar house and you can put down a hundred grand, right? That's that's Then you should have have $900,000 in your investment portfolio. Wow. That's a, how many people actually abide by that though? (laughs) But that's your advice. That's my advice. Okay. Stay debt free, everyone. I love that. Okay. Back to macro. You see how we're going here. We got macro. We got micro. We're down the middle. Okay. We kind of talked about this earlier. It's a pattern, Sam. We're having a pattern. It's a pattern. We talked about this earlier. So, you know, uh, we don't need to, um, this, these are the, I was going to talk to you about the unemployment job numbers. We did that. We did that. We'll move on. Back to macro. Okay, I got three words here. Okay. Explain it to me. Explain where you think we're going here. Um, The three words are this. Inflation, deflation, and stagflation. What does it mean? Where are we going? What's the deal? So this is the hardest question that exists. I mean, I spent spent an hour and a half with one of the biggest thinkers on this, um, Richard Werner, for my upcoming down the middle. We, we probably spoke for almost an hour and a half about what's coming down the pipeline. Because mm. we've had 40 years of disinflation. We've had 40 years of falling prices. We've had 40 years of declining interest rates that has made all of the nearly $300 trillion of global debt. It's enabled it. You have this environment where there's no penalty for taking on debt. Because the interests are so low, so it's like, low. whatever, so take low. on more debt. Easy, it's easy to service it. Okay. Um, 
there is a risk that we, right now we have inflation. We do. Supply chains are completely gnarled up. So you have, you have container ships that are deadheading out of, out of the ports in the, the, the three biggest ports, deadheading back to China, empty, because shipping costs are so high that it actually pays to just send the damn thing back to Shanghai so you can get the supplies back to the United States. 24% of all auto parts in America are sourced from China. So if, you have, if you're having a hard time getting things here, you end up with input costs at the highest levels since 2008. You end up with shipping costs at the high del supplier delivery times are longer than they've been since the early 1970s. So that's gonna create a near-term inflationary impulse. And that's what has got markets a little bit nervous today. That's why we're seeing an increase in interest rates that we really haven't seen. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've just come through the worst and quickest bond bear market. Uh, I think it was the third worst since 1870, just in the past few weeks. It's pretty magnificent how quickly people who own treasuries have lost money. But there's still 10 million Americans who are out of work and there's still 41 and a half of them who were permanently unemployed. That's disinflationary. As long as they don't have a job and, the, and job creation is not absorbing the slack in the, in the labor market, mm -hmm. that's going to pull prices down because they're not, their earning capacity is declining. So their ability to consume is falling. You're saying there's a correlation between the unemployment and the fact and, that oh, sure. prices aren't going to rise because... It's a drag on prices. I mean, okay. if you're just getting by or if you're relying on stimulus payments or if you're relying on unemployment, but some of it is also the fact that they're putting too much stimulus into the economy. Mm -hmm. So you're not paying a rent or a mortgage if you can okay. prove that, that post-COVID you, you can't afford it. That's 33% your, that's of your budget. That's mm -hmm. a form of stimulus on top of whatever you're getting with unemployment benefits. Right. So the concern about spending too much on stimulus is it's, it's going to be inflationary. And so we could see an inflation scare over the next few years if the Republicans take back the House and the Senate because they spend too much money on stimulus, that could come to a screeching halt and it could throw you back into a disinflationary world. So but, so what's worse of these things? Inflation, deflation is the worst. worst. Stag Why stagflation Stagflation is the worst because you have, you have declining economic growth and rising prices. Oh. Susie, you're going in the wrong direction. That's the 1970s okay. when they had the OPEC oil embargo and right. there were lines at, at gas stations that went around the corner. And I, that was stagflation. That's miserable. So should that be our biggest concern? When you hear inflation and deflation, listen, Well, hyper, hyperinflation is okay. the biggest concern. So hyperinflation so is even the worst. The Congressional Budget Office came out and said that the that U.S. debt by 2051 will be more than 200% of GDP. If that really happens, and, and by the way, it's not going to happen by 2051. It's happening a hell of a lot quicker. Where is it now, like 100%? Yeah. Oh, more okay. than. More than. Oh, We're wow. worse than China when it comes okay. to the, uh, the amount of debt that we have compared the to the worst? size of Japan? the economy. What, what is the worst? Japan is the worst by okay. far, but Japan is, all the debt is held internally. Mm -hmm. It's a domestic, they're paying themselves back. So that's why we've never really seen Japan go poof, hmm. despite all their debt. Um, hyperinflation and stagflation. Hyperinflation is the biggest risk if China's economy looks like it's gonna become bigger than the United States and people stop you know, ponying up at our treasury auctions, you could have a situation where borrowing costs for the United States rise appreciably. We do not want that. No, we do not. Moving on to, to, to micro. You talked about um, budgets, mm -hmm. right? This is a micro question. 75% uh, of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. Yep. I actually heard during COVID that that went up to probably closer to 78%, 80%. Does almost. not surprise me. Not, you know, um, Within a budget, you know, a budget pretty much broken down is your income minus your expenses, right? Mm -hmm. That's sort of the definition of a budget. And so, you know, in my opinion, everyone has the same three categories within their budget. The big three. Everyone has housing costs, mm -hmm. transportation, mm -hmm. and food and beverage. So, you and know, for a lot of, okay, you're showing you're single. For a lot of families, there's also health care. Healthcare okay. is your second largest budget but item. Everyone has these three. Oh, yeah. Everyone, yep. whether you're married, single, yep. you know, up, True. down, left, right, old, you know, yep. young, everyone has these three. And then they obviously do. everyone has healthcare mm -hmm. and childcare and cell phone, yeah. but everyone has these three. Um, these days, 
being that everyone has these three, you know, my whole thing is, you know, I don't, I don't have a car. I haven't had a car for 10 years. I know we joke about that. I've been able to save and invest a lot of money from, you from know, not having in, that big expense, not having that big expense. So in your opinion, uh, you talked about living together, mm-hmm. you know, family, um, just with those three big expenses in mind, what comes to mind? What tips do you have on so, how to you know, mitigate these expenses? I think that, um, I think Americans have kind of lost their minds when it comes to not not owning a car, but having to have the car. Mm. So, I mean, if it's an 84 month loan, there's something wrong. You're, you're stretching yourself so thin to get into that Raptor or whatever it's going to be so that you can drive the car. The Beamer. Whatever it is, and you can get the financing. You're like, as long as I can borrow, I'll do it. I mean, cars lose 50% of their value when you drive them off the lot, new cars. I mean, people need to understand that there's a utility, that you, and, and that's how you approach transportation. Mm-hmm. You want to get from point A to point B. That's I don't it. even want to leave point A. I just want to chill. Yeah. But if I am going to point B, I'll take an Uber. Sure. And I, I, I was the same way all the years that I lived in New York. Mm-hmm. And I, I buy my cars cash. And I own them for a decade. And I have extended warranties so that I make sure that my maintenance costs are mitigated. Yeah. But, but I look at it as being something that is a utility and not something that makes my budget where it's going to crack. So housing, yes, you can, but, but just because you're mitigating your housing expenses, let's say you've got three generations under one roof. Let's say you've got a baby boomer, millennials making babies and the babies that they make. So three generations underneath one roof. Just because you buy yourself budgetary wiggle room doesn't mean that you're like, God, I'm saving so much money now. Now I can go buy that car. Time to ball out on a Mercedes now. Exactly. So you have to look at everything as what function does it perform? The house keeps a, it keeps a roof over your head. Mm-hmm. The car gets you from point A to point B. So get what you need. What do you say to the people that are like, look, you only live once. I want to have the finer things in life. I of want course. to live in a nice place. I That's want to right. drive a nice car. Sure. But they're broke. But what's their retirement going to be like? Okay. You're like, you can have your experience today if you want it. But don't ever plan on leaving the workforce. You're going to work until the day you die if you never have the capacity to save. It's a scary thought. You know, you have half of, you know, I, this is my Bernie Sanders impression when he was running the president. He'd say, do you understand? That 50% of all retirees... Oh my gosh, you have, do that a little bit too I know, well. it's a little scary. Adam, because, you're scary. Are retiring with no oh money. Oh my God, I feel like we've got <laughs> Bernie Sanders you, Bernie. in the room. I'm There's not you, cheering Bernie. to Bernie. No, I'm cheering because you sound 50% like him. 50% of all retirees retire with no money. But that's true. 50% of retirees, well, 10,000 baby boomers... That's true. Turn, ...turn 65 every single day. Millennials, that's all true. Millennials are now taking over baby boomers as the largest generation in U.S. Yep. history... We've now been through 2008 and 2020. And millennials have like, what, $3,000 on average in savings? Way less than the boomers. So you see what's happening with the boomers. Half of them, you know, flip a coin whether they have money or don't in retirement. And millennials are trending in the wrong direction. And it's like the first generation uh, in U.S. history to make less than your parents. Yep. So for the person out there making 50 grand, but they're driving a Mercedes and having the time of their life, like you said, the retirement ain't looking pretty. It's not. And I think that the... One of the silver linings of this pandemic is that you've got millennials who, it was kind of a wake-up call. They're like, I don't want to be in an elevator. And even even if it was a temporary phenomenon, once we're all vaccinated, we're not going to care about being in, in crowded elevators anymore. But this mass movement out of metro centers, this mass rush away from densely populated big cities mm-hmm. that's leaving a lot of tall apartment buildings that are going to be have very shaky loans behind them. Commercial real estate's not a pretty picture right now. Mm. But this move out to the suburbs, um, you know, as long as they didn't buy more house than they could afford, I, I think millennials may be able to shift how they approach their finances now. Hopefully they're listening. Now that they're homeowners. Plus, I mean, you know, if, if they're homeowners, they're going to have kids. If their kids are going to be like, gee, I've got to, I've got to save for their colleges. And so it'll, it'll shift their way of thinking if they start to have kids. All my friends are starting to have kids now. All of them. So that's like why I'm not necessarily in a rush because I'm like the uncle to all my best we, friends' We kids, know you're not in a rush. My sister's kids. But I'll get there soon. And they're all calling me like, what What kind of college savings plan do you recommend? Exactly. Florida prepaid to 529? What do you got? And I'm like... Yeah, but they were having the time of their lives. They were the yeah. experiential buddies two years ago. This is more of a personal question, but you know, maybe recommendations of what sure. you've seen. 
your biggest financial regret or your worst purchase or the biggest waste of money. And if you had a mulligan, what would you do over? So when I left the Fed, I had like PTSD. Serious. I mean, I was inside the sausage factory. I'm watching the printing presses go 24-7. I'm horrified at these academics that, that are running the biggest economy on planet Earth. Me, who's Hence like, a, I'm, I'm like walking, talking, hyperactivity syndrome poster child. I, sat, I took two and a half years of my life and wrote a book. I mean, I've, I've never had that much focus in my life because I was so upset about what I saw. Mm. So I went, I was short the market. Now, I wasn't short the market for a long time, but I lost money being short the market because I'm like, I'll show them. What year was those it? damn money printers? It was this was um, this was 10, 2010. But you were shorting the market in 2010. No, no, I'm sorry. This was this was 2015. Sorry. Oh. 2015. Okay. 2015, and I lost money, and I realized that I was doing one thing and saying the other. Hmm. I'm on my Twitter feed saying. All you need to follow is the, the liquidity. As long as the Fed is pumping liquidity into the system, stocks will rise. So I knew it and I'd seen it and I'd bore witness to it, but I was so pissed off at what they were doing to the finances of the country, I wanted the stock market to fall. Y you can't look at it that way. It was like your emotions were taking over logic? Yes, or the, okay. exactly. Well, one thing I've learned from CEO Patrick Bet David Valuetainment, less emotion, more logic. Oh gosh, yes. A, People know, are always like, you're bitter, you're short the market. And I'm like, I, I'm, I'm on my Twitter feed and I'm like, I am not. Well, what do you think with, you not know, short this what market. do you think with all this, you know, GameStop, Reddit, shorting, hedge fund? Uh, what's again, your opinion on that? Um, you know, th that is to me emblematic more of, you know, the last time markets were looking this frothy was like 2017. What do you mean by frothy? I hear that term all the time. Overvalued. So, we, overvalued. you know, right, right now we're in the 99th percentile of valuations on the stock market going back to data from 1881. Hmm. So, I mean, it's really, it's, it's very speculative. But what we didn't have in 2017, because in 2017, as, as we ended the year, Jay Powell was getting ready to take over. He talked tough. He freaked out the markets. They're like, oh, my God, the Fed's not going to be my sugar daddy anymore. He had Volmageddon, where volatility spiked the first day he was in office, February the 4th, 2019. My birthday, ironically. There you go. I remember that, February so 4th. So then you know when his term ends, is yeah. next February the 4th, 2022. That would be the be best birthday present I could ever have. Unless they replace <laughs> him with somebody more dovish. My gosh. But there was the Powell pivot, and he was like, I was kidding. Okay, fine. I'll, I'll give I'll give the pacifier back to the baby, and liquidity started flowing back into the markets, and stocks popped back up. Mm -hmm. So, 2019 was more of a scare in the markets, and then the Fed just went pedal to the metal and started printing a ton of money, and here we are today. The difference between 2017 coming out of it when stocks were overvalued and we knew they were, and today is the retail investor. We didn't have retail participation a few years ago. At the level it is now. Now it's a fifth of volume. And they're buying calls. They're not even buying the underlying stocks. So they're juicing volumes. They're juicing liquidity. Everybody talks about, you know, Biddy and GameStop and AMC and what's being shorted next. Let's squeeze the hell out of it. These are just signs of, of I mean, people don't like to hear this, but the smart money typically exits stage left when retail goes over a certain percentage of trading, because they, they always say the dumb money comes in last mm -hmm. at the end of a cycle. So I look at the short sellers and Reddit and the chat boards and Robin Hood and the proliferate. You, I mean, you could, how many Uber drivers are probably talking about Bitcoin today? Oh, it's the talk of the town. Okay. So, but when you get there, the smart money is typically already gone. So what's your advice? Final piece of advice with that segment. Uh, you better be, if, if you're a nimble trader and you want to play these things, just understand that you're playing them. You're not investing in them. This isn't long-term investing. No, 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 this no, no, isn't no. A this, is, this is trading. This is, this this is, is trading. Pure incentive. It is gambling. It is pure gambling. There is a reason that Robin Hood is structured such that it feels like two young men that they're playing video games. That was how Robin Hood was designed. It was designed to appeal to the endorphins you get when, when you play video games. And that's exactly the people who are on it. And some of them are going to lose their ass. And some of them are going to lose their ass. Some of them did lose their ass on, on GameStop. That's right.
We addressed this a little bit ago. In the 1980s, interest rates were like double digits. If yeah, you had a mortgage, 1981, you know, your 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 overnight rates were like 18 percent, something insane. That's, uh, like if you had a mortgage rate, you could have been 15 percent. Absolutely. Your mortgage. Now we're less than three. Yep. Okay. So obviously, super low interest rates these days. What are the the pros and cons of this interest rate? you know, situation overall. So the, the the problem with interest rates being held at artificially low levels, because let's understand that's what the Fed is doing, is repressing interest rates. Mm-hmm. The problem with that is that now your average home loan, according to the Mortgage Bankers Association, is about $430,000. It's an all-time high. Average home loan is $430,000? Average purchase application. Wow. So home prices are at all-time highs because, again, Consumers are approaching homes like they approach cars. All they're looking at is the payment. And the lower your interest rate is, the lower the payment's gonna be, the more home you can buy. Mm -hmm. If interest rates ever rise, you're not going anywhere. If interest rates rise, you might lose your home. You might get foreclosed on. If they have an adjustable mortgage or how does it work with fixed uh, rates? Well, a fixed rate mortgage should be tenable, but if home prices fall Mm -hmm. because interest rates rise, Bear in mind, okay, so here's something easy. Purchase applications on Thanksgiving 2020, not very long ago, were up 28% year over year. I mean, housing was roaring. On fire. Fast forward to the latest week. Purchase applications to buy a home were up 1% and on the brink of going negative year over year because we've had a little move up over 3% in the 30 year fixed. Mm If you buy with an FHA loan, 3% down, you borrow from your parents, you stretch, 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 and home prices start to fall. And home prices falling are possibly accompanied by a slowing economy. So if you lose your job, or if your wife loses her job, if one of you loses, and all of a sudden you've got this mortgage you stretch to get into and you need to get out of the house. Mortgage rates are higher. You're upside down on the house. You owe more on it than it's worth. It's very 2008, 2009. And yet here we are. Scary thought if, you, if, you're, if you're buying too much house. If you're buying too much house. Okay. Um, what about the stock market? Uh, what's your advice? You know, that's sort of home. But I'm, I'm on the sidelines right now. Really? I'm not in the stock market right now. You personally are not? I invest- personally am not in the stock market. Now, I seed companies. So, which is even riskier. Private equity is ri- much riskier than public equity. But mm-hmm. let's be. Yeah. So I, I am taking on risks, but I can't wrap my head around valuations and why stocks are where they are. So I'm I'm on the sidelines. So be, I'm just going to read between the lines here. Being that you're on the sidelines, does that mean you're expecting the bubble to burst pretty soon? And well, we're starting to see. Uh, I mean, volatility. Pe- the stock, the stock market rose back to all-time highs post-pandemic. Right. We know that. It's all-time highs right now. It's, it's had a rough week or two. But in 2017, people, people follow the VIX index pretty closely, don't they? Volatility. Volatility index. index yeah. uh, the volatility, how much stocks can be expected to move going out in the, into the future. In 2017, the VIX was in a single-digit territory 52 record times at the close. The prior year before there was like 1996, 1993, it had been like four. Okay. So there was immense complacency in the market. People did, did not anticipate that stocks were going to do anything because the VIX was so quiet. Hmm. The VIX post-COVID has been north of 20 for a record stretch. So there is anxiety being exhibited in the market that there's downside risk. And so that's what you follow. You follow how much movement is anticipated looking out. So assuming this 1.9 trillion stimulus package Oh, it's passes, good. It's, it could go right into the stock market. Okay. So isn't that an indicator that the stock market would go higher? Sure. And your volatility okay. will probably go higher as well. But that's still... Remember, you've got tech stocks. You've got tech stocks that are down for six months, more mm-hmm. than the broad average right now. It's, it's very quiet because there's still all this euphoria out there. Mm. But people are starting to lose money. So what's your advice to the average investor out there? I guess let me give you two scenarios. I haven't even started in the stock market. I don't, Danielle, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm 30 years old. Save your money. 
Just save. Save your money right now. And what about someone who's, you know, 50, 60, they're not retired yet, but they're kind of getting their you direction. Know, if, if they've they're got, in it, though. They've got if, a half if, a million dollars in the market, whatever. So you need to you need to pare back that exposure if you are uh, if you're thinking about living on a fixed income. What do you mean you pare can, back exposure? Go more to bonds? Sure. So buy gold, whatever. Gold. Bitcoin? I'm not going there. Silver. Silver? Silver. Kiyosaki loves silver. Silver is, the beauty of silver is it's precious and it's industrial. Oh yeah. I, I, it's I, got multiple uses. I almost got a tattoo with silver. I yeah. don't have any tattoos. I mean, Based on Kiyosaki, I'm like, I'm all in on silver yeah, now. The, the precious metals complex has really been beaten up because mm. people believe that Bitcoin's the, the currency of the future. But I think that Xi Jinping would have something to say about that. I don't, I don't think that he plans on, I don't think China plans on Bitcoin taking over as the reserve currency status. I think China plans on that being their currency and not giving up control to something electronic, which is why China's rolling out its own digital currency right now. Wow. So. We'll circle there, back to yeah. Bitcoin. I know that we don't want to yeah, have yeah. A, an hour long Bitcoin. Next down the middle question Let's with go. Danielle DiMartino Booth, host of Down the Middle on Value Time. see how that works out. So the topic- By the way, I, I, should, I should jump in here for just a second. Down the middle is because people who follow me on social media can't figure out where I stand because I mm. try and keep it in the middle. And I think that the middle is what's been lost in this country. I so I, I speak for that moderate. Anyways. I'm with you. Let me dap you up to that one. Boom. We're drinking. We're dapping. We're having a great it's Friday. time. Friday. It's Friday. Jobs yeah. Friday. Jobs Friday. The, the topic here is why isn't money taught in schools? We all go to school. We all learn algebra, biology, chemistry, Gosh. trigonometry, whatever, whatever. Woodshop I even took. Why isn't it just money classes? Why isn't it Look, exist? I, you, you, you just, that, that is my hottest hot button ever, financial literacy. I mean, if, if, if people understood basic budgeting, if people had you know, understood borrowing rates and the importance of saving, just just basic financial literacy. Why is that not in high schools in America? Why? I mean, it is, it is the most critical. Your economy is, I mean, your life is your financial literacy. It dictates your lifestyle, what you do and don't know about money. So, you know, if, if, if kids had a better approach to financial literacy when they were in high school, they might look at college differently. They might say, you know what, the return on that investment for that art major mm -hmm. for the next four years that it's going to take on student debt and there's no jobs at the end of that. They might approach how they look. They might be like, you know, I'm going to suck it up and go to engineering school because I get a return on investment from doing that. You've said the word return on investment twice. Yeah. ROI. ROI. I remember I didn't know what the hell that even meant until I was like graduated college. Like, what's the ROI in that? I said, excuse me? When I was approaching, I so I, I, I genuinely didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up, when I was thinking about graduate school. Nobody really does though, right? So, so I, I, I said, well, I'm, I'll take the LSATs, the GMATs, and the GRE, <laughs> and I'll see where the chips fall. And I did that like inside of a month, which I do not recommend. Um, so anyways, I ended up applying to law school. I applied to business school. I got my acceptance letters, I lined them up, I looked at average starting salaries from all, all the schools, and that's how I chose what I was gonna do. So what'd you choose at that point? I chose to get an MBA based on University of Texas. It was like a starting salary of an average of $73,000. I said, fine, that makes sense compared to what the average salary of a criminal attorney would, would have been. Mm -hmm. So that, I mean, but that's how, I, I didn't know what I was gonna do, but I did know that I needed to have a return on my investment whether I'm investing time or money, you have to approach your education methodically because that's gonna dictate what your earning power is when you go into the rest of your life. That's so powerful what you said, whether you're investing time or money. Or money. Right, because time is money. Time's money. money. You know? And schools, four years, business schools, another couple of years, yeah. six years, with like law schools, three years, you know. I mean, people don't make what they make. Well, people don't make what they made a generation ago from a four-year degree. You know, it's like educational inflation. You know, this next generation almost has to get a master's degree in order to kind of hang steady with the prior generation in terms of their earnings capacity. It's just a fact of life. ROI. ROI. If you don't know it, now you know. ROI. Okay, back to macro. So we're going in, in, in order here. Um, this is actually a fun question. Explain the Fed to a fifth grader. The Federal Reserve is the biggest bank in the country. 
It's the bank that banks go to when the banks need loans. So it's the big bank. And the Federal Reserve sets interest rates. And interest rates dictate how much you can borrow. And interest rates dictate how much you can make on your savings, which is an antiquated notion because today that answer is nothing. I can't make anything on my... Not at all. But, you know, it wasn't that long ago. I mean, if you want to go back to 2005, I think it was, that you could make 5% on a CD. Just park your money in a bank and make 5% and not think about it. Doesn't exist anymore. It doesn't exist anymore. It's changed the way that we invest. Federal Reserve policy is the most critical determinant of how much debt you're going to have and how you're going to be able to invest. Because when they take interest rates to the zero bound where they are right now, they effectively make it to where you have to go into the stock market because you're not going to make any money with your cash mm -hmm. if you want to, or, or if you want to sit in the bond market. So it, the, the Federal Reserve is the most important determinant of your financial future. Wow. To a fifth grader, I think they can understand that. Now, one, one question with that, you know, people always say, like, return on your investment. We just talked about cash. You're not supposed to be, at least for the last however many years. Cash is trash. Right. You hear that. But it's like, no, you need to have the cash so you can start to invest. Of course. So it's the, 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 it's, having the it's cash a cart, isn't it's a about horse, the rate of return. It's the horse, the cart, the horse. I get it. But you have to have the money to invest. And for God's sake, if you make a lot of money investing, always have sell discipline. If you feel like something has gone up too much, just take your cost basis off the table. Mm -hmm. Just just take what you invested off the table so you can technically say, I didn't lose a dime. Yeah. And then let your profits ride. Well, that's where it. I'm at right now. Is I think I'm like, based on the conversation we had, a little sidebar, time for me to take my profits, cost basis, and- Let the profits cost ride. cost basis is tax free. Sure, well, if, if they're long-term gains, it's a no-brainer. We're learning here, folks. Pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered. Remember that. We're learning here. Back to micro, we touched on this a little bit. We'll probably throw up an image of this right now. We're talking about the federal debt clock. Oh God! You've seen this, oh, yeah. and and the debt and the we're at we twenty seven trillion. We just and crossed twenty eight trillion a few days ago. Twenty eight trillion. Where was I? And we're about to print another one point nine. So we're let's round it up to thirty. Woo! So, America know, first. Something like twenty five percent of all dollars ever printed. Uh, the dollar supply was printed in twenty twenty. I've heard of higher numbers. This is this is more just a WTF, Danielle. What are we doing about this? We're, we're, we're trying to give the farm away to China. We're trying to destroy our economy. There's no consequences for debt. You can pay universal basic income. Why should people have to work? It's a slippery slope. What are we going to do, though? Like, at, at some point, our taxes going to have to go up? Like That's the game plan right now. That's, to, what, they're, that's, what, they're, that's what they're discussing right now, is, is rising taxes. But the debt's going to continue to accumulate. Is there any way, if taxes don't go up, that we can pay this off? GDP? Like, explain this to me, to a you, fifth grader, you, you, how we can pay You can this try off. and inflate but, your way out of it. Uh, but that's a slippery slope, too. If you want to create enough inflation to make the debt easier to service, but what if you get real inflation? Hmm. What if your buying power gets sapped away? What if your dollar gets decimated? What if your paycheck buys half of what it used to? Uh, it's it's a slippery slope. One more micro because it ties in with this. That says macro. I'm sorry. One more macro. One more macro because uh, we are running out of time. We're going to probably have to do this again next time. I have you're to here. come back to Florida. You have to. Oh, you have, I'm sorry. You got to go the back. The pain, to, the misery. You got to drink wine with me on a drink Friday. Wine, and Louis Bossies. And, uh, you know, we're going to have to do it. I'll come in for the next non farm um, payroll Friday. Woo! Jobs Friday. That could be fun again. Um, we talked about the debt and everything. Um, this is correlated, but the minimum wage debate, mm -hmm. universal basic income, what are your thoughts on that? Universal basic income was, was tried in Finland, and they found that the recipients were happier in general, but it did nothing for the economy and it did nothing for the workforce. Mm. So unemployment did not decrease, GDP did not increase, but the people receiving money to not work were happier. That's funny how that works. That's called a negative return on investment. <laughs> so it's not good policy. And universal basic income also implies that the modern monetary theory, which we could spend a whole day talking about, but the, the theory behind it is that if inflation rises, you, you take the power away from the Federal Reserve to increase and decrease 
interest rates, if inflation starts to rise, instead you just raise income taxes. That's your new lever. And that's going to work because our, our Congress can get things done like in five minutes. Right. Yeah, it's a really functional Congress. So yeah, of course. So UBI, not so much. Um, you know, there is something to be said for a minimum wage, but that is, in my view, the state's purview. State I'll, by state. I'll, I'll make this really simple. Yeah. My mother was born and raised in Pearsall, Texas. The average home price in Pearsall, Texas is $74,000. My father was born and raised in East Haven, Connecticut. The average home price there is $250,000. Okay? So if you're a small business owner in Pearsall, Texas, can you afford to pay $15 an hour? You cannot. Do you need $15 an hour to live in a town with that low of living expenses? No, you don't. So it really does need to be on a state-by-state -state basis. And imposing a federal minimum wage when we've seen so many small businesses go out of mm -hmm. post-pandemic, be, be shuttered, it would be the death knell for a lot of small businesses in states where it's not that expensive to live. So this is my common sense question or POV. It seems so obvious, right? If you're in New York City or San Francisco or in South Florida, right. we get it. $15, sure, $15 we course. get it. it, makes sense. You're in Pearsall, Texas or Bumble F, Oklahoma, or whatever. Right, your living expenses doesn't, are not that. Doesn't, why does that not sink through to the people trying to pass this? The Dems. Because it's it's it sounds good. They're sound bites. Everybody must, we must take people out of poverty. I'm, I'm sorry, but... And, is that really what it is? They're just looking oh, for good sound of bites? Of course. I mean, it, I, look, I'm pretty cynical when it comes to politicians, but who yeah. isn't? But, you know, at the same time, I, I mean, you're looking at Little Caesar's Pizza Pizza right here. I, I started Love off... Love Little Caesar's Pizza Pizza. Well, I didn't. I didn't like working there pizza, at pizza. all. I lied on my job application. I was 15. <laughs> I smelled like pizza dough and canned sauce every night. But I knew that, but then I learned, it's like, okay, <laughs> this is a it. start job. This is the first job of your career. I mean, I, I, I'd love to know if somebody was still working at that Little Caesars Pizza Pizza 30 years <laughs> later, but I hope to God not. I mean, seriously, it's supposed to be a starting job. Right. It's supposed to be the You're job that, the job that you do the that's like, oh, this is why I've got to go to school and get an education. Or this is why I need to become a plumber and make a lot of money or an electrician. Mm -hmm. Because I don't want to do that minimum wage job for the rest of my life. So it's supposed to be a learning. It's supposed to be a stepping stone. Stepping stone. Don't just stay there forever. Right. Because then it's you'll like smell like pizza sauce forever. Pizza, pizza. It's a thing. <laughs> it's a thing we got going on. Okay, I know you told me at the beginning of this interview, Danielle, you do not want to spend an hour talking oh, about Bitcoin. Oh, bitty, bitty, you know bitty, 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 bitty. They got the bitty bops and the bitty boops and the betty boop. But it's so hot right now, we got to talk about it. Uh, so my first question is to you is just gold or Bitcoin, where would you invest your money? I have my money in gold. Okay, so we already have that answer. And just give us your thoughts on just everything that's going on with Bitcoin and crypto and blockchain. Are you a believer? Is it part of your portfolio? I'm, store of value, digital gold? If it's a store of value, then you're smoking crack because <laughs> any anything that can go from 58,000 to 48,000 is not, it's not a store yeah. of value. It's a hell of a roller coaster ride. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. I mean, that's what go-go investments are. But if Bitcoin is going to be a store of value, it's going to have to become a much less volatile asset class, period. Looking for stability here. Well, that's what a store of value is. Okay, so it's forget about the store stable. of value. But, you know, put on your crystal ball, I get it. You're not a, but it's it, it went in the last six months from 10,000 oh, to I'm, almost 50,000, not I, more. I see it, which is, uh, that's not normal. No, agreed. But that's what happens, sure. I guess, when you start printing a printing party at the pizza party, pizza, pizza, you know, like it's happening. Well, of course, everybody wants to make money easily. Nobody wants to work. For their money. Everybody Ooh. just wants to, people don't want to save money to invest. They want to save very little money and have the investment explode. That's what they want to do. They want the easy way out. So you, you see some people ending up with, with severe egg on their face with the, with the Bitcoin? Well, who, who bought at 58,000? It's some now people. at 48,000. Right. Because they've heard it's going to 400,000. Right. But again, I mean, I go back to the bigger picture. I don't think China's going to sit down and let some digital currency become the global reserve currency. Okay. I think China's got their eye on the prize. We have this interview one year from now, mm -hmm. right? It's early 2022. Don't ask me where I think Bitcoin's going to no, be. It's I, in a bubble. I mean, I, okay. you it think could it's be 100,000. I mean, it really depends on 
how much more liquidity the Fed can pump into the system without generating an, enough inflation to kind of blow up this debt bubble that we're sitting on. Okay. So if the Fed can keep the party going, you know, theoretically, and, and people see Bitcoin as kind of Fed defense. Mm-hmm. That's how they look at it. Because if, like if, if the Fed's going to do this, I'm going to do that. Hedging against the... Uh... That's, that's how it's viewed. So last point with Bitcoin. You start to see these, uh, it's starting to get legitimacy. You're starting to see Tesla and Square and, you know, JP Morgan and certainly open up a desk. And they're, they're, the, the number that I've seen mm-hmm. is somewhere between 3 and 8% of their cash reserves putting into Bitcoin. That's sort of the number I've seen. Not JP Morgan. Not JP, okay. But Square and Square, Tesla. Square, Tesla yes. and... Uh, Goldman Sachs is starting to look at it. Maybe Goldman Sachs is opening up their desk. There's a lot of money to be made in Bitcoin. Okay. So, I mean, without a doubt. And as we have been discussing, China's not going to take over tomorrow. So as long as you still view, view the dollar as being trashed by fiscal policy, by Federal mm-hmm. Reserve policy, then, and, and until China is a viable alternative. And China, as a medium of exchange... The yuan is growing. So Mm -hmm. that needs to be on people's radars. Okay. But until China has that power, if you will, people are still going to look to Bitcoin as being the alternative to the trashing of the dollar. What what percentage of someone's portfolio? Let's just talk asset allocation for a second, I guess. It depends on your age. I mean, you know, maybe, maybe, I mean, you need to look at the most go-go corner of your portfolio and call it 5%, call it 10%, whatever you want. If, if you want to play 50, that game. Not 80%. Some people I know, all they have is a crypto account. No 401k, no stock exposure, no bonds. But they're all in on crypto. Could get ugly. For them. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Okay. Asset allocation. We're learning other things today. Right, we're going we're gonna to wrap up. We're gonna, I'm going to pick my favorite macro, my favorite micro, and then we'll move on. You hear this term a lot. I, I'm going to go here. I'm going to go here with this. You hear this term... Well, that's Main Street and that's Wall Street. Uh, it's, uh, Wall Street isn't what's happening on Main Street. Main Street, Wall Street. Yeah. In your opinion, what's the, the, the core differences between what's happening on Wall Street and what's actually happening on Main Street? So Wall Street is the chief beneficiary of Federal Reserve policy. So they are, they're, print, they are printing money. I mean, if you think about the simple mechanics of quantitative easing, large-scale asset purchases, mm-hmm. the Federal Explain Reserve... Explain quantitative easing for that. So the Federal Reserve cannot legally buy treasuries at auction. Then they would technically be directly monetizing the U.S. debt. Mm-hmm. So in the original Federal Reserve Act of 1913, that was like, we don't want that. We'll have the Weimar Republic on our hands. We'll have hyperinflation. So it, therefore, when the Federal Reserve wants to buy a treasury, they have to buy it in the secondary market from a great big bank. Mm -hmm. So the bank gets to generate fees. When the Federal Reserve keeps interest rates at artificially low levels, companies merge, they acquire each other, they take on debt, they do deals, they work through investment banks who make a lot of fee income. And Wall Street benefits because the Fed is pumping liquidity into the market and people on Wall Street own these investments. So there's three ways that Wall Street's making money, but they're making money on a fundamental level as well, because the Federal Reserve is creating business for investment banks to do with their policies. So they're making investment bankers wealthy with their policies, because they have to carry out Fed policies. Somebody's got to sell them the treasury bonds. Somebody's got to sell them the mortgage-backed securities. There's a transaction cost in there. goes straight to the bottom line. So Main Street, again, 45% of Americans do not own stocks. 45% of Americans um, don't have the benefit that is flowing through to Wall Street. And on top of that, a lot of Americans who do own stocks and who have benefited from Federal Reserve policy, they're in 401ks that they have no control over. So they have a limited number of options. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are forced into the stock market. So as we talked about earlier, when the smart money gets out early, when the big investors on on Wall Street leave early, they take all their profits, right? Because when when the stock market does correct, the exit's really small. But Wall Street's already out, they're already out the door. They've taken their profits. They've bought their newest house in the Hamptons. They've, They've cashed it all in. But 
the guy in the 401k, that exit's not going to be there for him. So he's going to have to stay in the stock market slowly and earn it back. Mm -hmm. Whereas Wall Street's like, they take their profits, they wait until st stocks get cheaper, they jump back in. Just, so they, when the fun, ju just when the little guy is like, this is too painful, I'm selling. Yeah. So the, the little guy tends to sell, sell at the bottom. Well, you That's always Main hear, Street. You always hear things like, um, you can't time the market, it's just time in the market. Stay in the market, up, and, and down, that, left, And right. we've been ingrained to think that way because most of us have not been alive for as, I mean, most investors, think about it, 1981. Interest rates have been falling for 40 years now. Mm -hmm. So of course stocks have been rising. But most living investors today cannot remember a rising interest rate environment that puts stocks at risk. And that could be a game changer, again, if the US government is determined to grow that $28 trillion, it's already gonna be $30 trillion like by mid-March, but to keep growing that, you're gonna flirt with inflation. And that's the bottom line. And that's the bottom line, scary thought. Okay, let's get one more micro, one more down the middle, and then we'll move on to the wrap up. Okay, this is a simple one. Simple, simple, simple. U.S. tax system. Why is it so damn complicated? Remember the guy that ran for, uh, I think it was like mayor of New York City, and he's like, the rent is too damn high. This is me doing my version of why are taxes so damn complicated? Why can't we just have like a flat tax, something simple? Taxes, Danielle. Uh, look, I think simplifying the tax code is something we should have done a generation, two generations, three generations ago. I mean, you shouldn't, uh, you know, you, your CPA, you, you shouldn't have to have a CPA so that the CPA can get around all the loopholes and get mm -hmm. through the thousands of pages of the tax code. It's absolutely bullshit. And it's something that Congress should have addressed a long time ago. Will they ever address it? Who knows? I mean, these are the difficult infrastructure, education reform, tax reform. They're such difficult, thorny things. And to, to, to conquer, if you're in Congress, why we need term limits when, you know, we're barely free of the presidential election and everybody's already campaigning for the midterms. Yeah. So they're not focused on doing their jobs. They're focused on keeping their jobs, yeah. which means they're not doing their jobs. So these are very thorny issues. That's why I think we have the basis to have a third party in this country because we've got to figure out how to make government work. If we can get a decent third party candidate who has a chance, the sure. last one we had was Ross Perot. May he rest in peace. It's a good man down in Texas. That's right. Good friend. Um, Ross Perot. Who, who was the person that made the flat tax popular? Was that Steve Forbes? Yes. Was it Perot? Well, who was that? Perot was there too. Yeah. I like I this mean, flat it's, tax. I mean, we talked about it on the podcast. You know, if, yeah. if you make under a certain amount of money, you don't file taxes. Right. You just don't, no taxes for you. Listen up, people out there. This is our last down the middle question and then we'll move into the wrap up. And I think we've had a great time. We're sure. drinking wine, we're having fun, Absolutely. we're learning. This is valuetainment. We're delivering value and we're having some fun. Yeah. I'll just ask you both and we'll make it quick and then we'll move on. Okay, so the two questions are this. Um, do you have some sort of greatest life lesson or words to live by that have affected you? And part B to that is like, what is the secret to your success or success in general? So greatest life lesson, words to live by, secret to success with DDB, Danielle DiMartino Booth. So my mother instilled in me the importance of education. And I, I got my second master's at Columbia in journalism. You know, the return on the investment, maybe it wasn't what it, I didn't really want to be a journalist, but it opened doors for me. So, you know, when I was an adult on Wall Street, I was sent myself to night school. Cause I'm like, I can't spend all my money on shoes and champagne. <laughs> so I like literally, I put myself in the corner and I'm like, you better go back to school now. But the importance of education cannot be understated. It just can't, not in this country. And, you know, as far as my, my greatest life lesson, the thing that I have done that's the most important is working hard. You got to have a strong work ethic. Nothing comes easy in this world, but hard work pays off. It's not a cliche. It's the truth. It is the truth. And perfect segue here. When you work hard, you get to play hard. You get to play hard. And we're going to move on to the last segment here. We'll put a little more wine he in our cups. It's big Friday. smile on Danielle. So it's, it's not it, a pizza. So 
Pizza, pizza. That's I don't think Paul's I'll be having pizza thing. for like ever now. That just even having memories, flashbacks. We had to talk about the minimum wage, didn't we? We had to. We got a couple different quick questions, and then we'll we'll do this again. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we talked some some scary stuff that was going on here. Yeah. Um, but my first question is: Give me some good news. Give me something positive that I can hang my head Look, on and be like, you know what? The yeah, last. Okay. All right. The last time, and we're we're close to. Cape Canaveral. The last time this country was a badass country, we were sending people to the moon. We landed a, a, we, we landed something on Mars a few days ago. Yeah. Musk. If you want to grow intelligence from the inside out, get people excited about studying science and math again. Mm. And that's happening. So that's when you're going to get kids who are like, I don't want to take statistics, who are like, I'm going to, I'm I'm going there. So get people excited to make work fun. Make the hard stuff fun again. Send people to the moon. Send people Hell to Mars. Yes. Get people excited. Let's do it. And you need more engineers. I dig it. Uh, ready for a little rapid fire? I'm going to say a name. That, you say the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. And uh, we'll go there. Speaking of sending people to the moon, first person, Elon Musk. Crazy brilliant. Crazy brilliant. Uh, the person that he's neck and neck with in terms of the world's wealthiest pe- person, Jeff Bezos. Hard worker. You got to work hard to play hard. We know that. Bill Gates. Fantastic philanthropist. It's true. The, uh, the billionaire pledge. It's amazing. It is amazing. Um, possibly the greatest investor of all time, Warren Buffett. Tired. Tired. Get he- some sleep, Warren. It's well, A, he's 90, but B, you know, he just released his annual letter and there mm-hmm. was nothing controversial in you were it. Not, you were not pumped up about no, that. He didn't he, get people excited. He didn't talk about the stock market. He didn't talk about politics. He didn't talk about divisiveness in America. He just avoided all the hard questions. I'm going to have to call Warren and tell him to step if, if it's time for him, to, for him to retire, he needs okay, to retire. Okay, let's talk about sort of the newer class of like big time investors. Kathy Wood. Trailblazer. Trailblazer. She's only investing in what does she calls um, but she's also down 20% disruptive companies. Yeah, I get oh, that. Okay. But she's also down 20%. So you I, again, if you're going to play with fire, you have to be prepared to get burned. Or make some pizza. Or make some damn pizza. <laughs> damn. Um, investor who's all over the news these days and if you don't know him uh, out there, I, I love watching what this guy has to say, Chamath Palapatia. Pied Piper. The Pied Piper. Follow my lead seems to be. But just okay. understand, he sold his entire Virgin Galactic share just today. We found that out. Mm. Just understand that the, the way these SPACs are designed is the people who establish them always get their money out. So be careful when you follow the Pied Piper and, you know, in the event he's leading you over a cliff. When he's doing the SPAC stuff. Right. Okay. Just be careful. Um, personal finance people, Dave Ramsey, what comes to mind? That's, he, he was an inspiration and validated my views on not having debt. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Robert Kiyosaki, speaking of debt. You know, we we agree on mortgage rates. There you go. (laughs) And silver. Okay. Uh, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on this person, Susie Orman. Again, she's another person who was a pioneer in helping people become financially literate. They listen to her. Mm -hmm. And if you can build a following, uh, you know, people say my Twitter feed is like a free economics degree. It should be. So, Where can they find your Twitter feed? Just at Demartino Booth. There it is. So, but again, if if you can spread knowledge and get people excited about learning about financing mm-hmm. and budgeting and personal investing, I'm all for it. Good for her. Speaking of exciting and investing, Jim Cramer. Not my cup of tea. Really? Okay. We'd rather drink wine. Sorry, Jim. Um, you might want to put your drink down for this next name. Uh oh. Janet Yellen. Oh gosh. <sighs> Hashtag J and J, J and Janet. Okay. You've got two very devish people in the house. Jerome Powell, you're saying? Yeah. Jerome I mean, look, Powell and she, Janet. She is the one person, and she's very powerful now as Treasury Secretary. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's the one person who can make socialism doable in this country. Ooh, yes. She's got that power. Wow. And she is a UC Berkeley educated labor economist. She wants to get money to the people. Speaking of. Potential socialism, Elizabeth Warren. Always campaigning. 
You know, I term mean, limits. we need some term. Limits. We need some term limits. We, we okay. really do. I, I understand what she's trying to accomplish, but she's a gazillionaire herself. So hmm. I, you can overregulate the banking system and end up hurting Main Street. You can take aim at Wall Street, but inevitably Main Street's going to pay the price. And I don't know that Elizabeth Warren connects those two dots. OK. Um, last name on this list, Alan Greenspan. He was the original instigator. He started this shit show. Excuse my French. He started this. His obsession with the stock market and not having been popular in high school. It was just a bad combination. And he that comes out in his That's bat- where we're going with this. That comes Chairman out in- of the Fed. And next thing you know, you got some high school uh Look, it came out in, it came out in, his, that's in, out. in his biography that he didn't want to disappoint the people. Damn. So even though he knew he was, you know, kind of blowing up this huge housing bubble, he didn't want to disappoint them. Damn. Okay. I just, we went through a bunch of names. You didn't even say AOC. Congratulations. Uh, okay. I didn't want to go too political. I no, just wanted, okay. okay. I was going to say, actually, I was going to give this up. What's the one name that I have not said that you would love to give some two cents on? Danielle's two cents on, who would I not so mention? So when I was invited out to Omaha mm-hmm. by Warren Buffett, I ended up getting to know his partner, Charlie Munger, better. Hmm. And you now he's got some stones. Yeah. And 94 years old, 95. He is, but I mean, but he, he doesn't care anymore. He says what's on his mind. He's not near as measured as Buffett is, and I respect him for that. So hmm. when he speaks, which is not very often, listen. Charlie Munger. Okay, that was the rapid fire segment. We're, we're winding down here. Now here's my- um, We're winding down here. Winding <laughs> down here. Um, this, ah, I this, need to get out more. We, we talked about having to save and invest. You can have retirement yeah. and, and um, sort of a loaded question, but the question is this, what does that word say? Chilling. Chilling. So I have a term for what I call retirement. Like retirement is completely being reinvented. People are living longer. Well, you know. Yeah, you know, of course. Um, 80 is re- the new 70. 80 is the new 70. People, I mean, my grandma's going to be 90. I know people are living to our hundreds. Yeah, know, as yeah. long as you take care of yourself. Retirement, you know, when Social Security and retirement sure. was a thing, it was like early to mid 60s. And it was, retirement has changed. Um, so Chilling to me is when you've saved up enough and you've made enough, you invested enough that you you can own your time. You know, we said time yeah. is money. You can own your time. Yeah. You don't have to go to work. You're working on like really what you want to do. Like I'm in the chilling phase right now where I've made my money, but now I want to do stuff like this and a little bit yeah. more creative. So what is chilling to you? What's your chilling? Chilling to me is a beach in the Caribbean that's in the middle of nowhere with nobody, just about. Solos, you bring in your husband? Yes. Okay. But Your kids? No. <laughs> that so was chilling. easy. Okay, so. It's truly getting away, it's truly unplugging. Unplugging, especially these days. Uh, follow up with that, the American dream, just like retirement has kind of changed, mm-hmm. in my opinion. American dream used to, you know, uh, have a job, you work over the job, you'd get a house, white picket fence, you know, you live in the same community, that, typical American dream. Do you think that's the same? And if not, how much has it changed? I think the best thing that COVID has done, it's taught us all about the importance of spending time with our family and closest friends. Uh, it, I think it's it's been a wake up call in a good way mm-hmm. that we were running in too many different directions. And when we were forced to be locked down with our family, we all started doing more stuff together. And that I think is gonna have a permanent imprint. And if you, if you reinforce the social fabric, the family in America, you're going to have a stronger economy. Okay. I love it. I love this. This is the last question. We are wrapping up here. It's the simplest question of the day. Uh, as you can see, it says final, final question. Final question. And the question is this, Danielle. <clears throat> Save that money or spend that money? Save it. Save that money. You can say you save today, you spend tomorrow. Pretty simple. Let me hear you say save that money. Save that money. Danielle, it's been a privilege. It's been an honor. We've had some fun. You feeling okay? I'm feeling great. Okay. Thank you so much, and thank you to all you guys watching on Value Tank. All we talk is money. All we talk is money. All we talk is money. All we talk is money.